Week 2 of my 4 week Godot 4 challenge is now over. This is going to be a long one, so strap in. Sunday got off to a slow start. I didn't let myself get enough sleep, so I was kind of out of it for a lot of the day, on top of having other stuff I needed to do. Once I properly sat down to get some work done though, I immediately set out to tweak the player model some more. Initially this may seem like a silly idea, as there's a lot of programming work that still needs to get done before I worry about making things look pretty, but it's more in depth than that. I'm gonna need a lot of animations, and it's much better that I properly set my model up now rather than do so 20 animations in and realize I broke half of them. First thing to fix up was armature weights. I'm not going to give a super in-depth explanation on what this is, since I'm really not the person to ask. But here's a summary. Bones have weights assigned to each vertex in the model, which essentially states how much control the bone has over specific points in the mesh. A weight of 0 means it has no control, and a weight of 1 means it has full control, with in-between values giving in-between results. I can't speak for how Blender handles high-poly models, but when it comes to low poly models, it's basically just guessing where it should initially assign the weights. Plenty of the weights were asymmetrically applied, and many bones clearly had way less influence or way more influence than they should have. I got it all set up to be much closer to how I want, though it's still not perfect. Probably something I'll get a better feel for as I continue making rigged models, but for now it's fine. During the process of reassigning the weights, I also made tweaks to the mesh itself specifying where faces get split into triangles, tweaking positioning, removing unnecessary faces, adding new ones where needed, etc. In the end I think I got things looking a fair bit nicer. I was actually worried I was getting a little too polygon happy, but Blender revealed that I'm only using 710 triangles. That might sound like a lot for a low poly character, but Mario's model in Mario 64 actually uses 750, partly due to how each of his limbs are closed off pieces. My model definitely looks more detailed than what you'd expect from a PS1 or N64 game, but I'm comfortable in knowing that it's well within the limits of what those systems could theoretically render decently. After I did that, I decided to redo the running animation. I wasn't sure I'd be doing it this soon, but I figured redoing an animation that needed it anyway would be a good place to start in testing the new mesh and weights. I spent a good while on it, and again, it's still not amazing, I feel, but I'm much happier with this than I was the old one, so I'd call it a win. Since I started late, and it was getting late, I decided to call it a night there. I started off Monday by tweaking the run animation just a teeny bit more, and then getting to work on extra jump and landing animations. In particular, I needed an animation for the double jump, the triple jump, and the soft landing, since the original landing animation I made just didn't feel right for landing from your standard jump height. The double jump animation ended up being basically indistinguishable from the original jump animation, but that's actually because I was being an idiot and didn't actually use the animation in game for like two days. The triple jump animation was sort of an ordeal, because I wanted the character to do a flip. Making a character spin in Blender is a complete gamble, and the odds are not stacked in your favor. What I ended up doing was keyframing the roll at very short intervals, with only one in between frame each time. There were a few frames where I was kind of getting owned by the tweening either way, so I had to jump in and add a new keyframe where the problem was, and tweak it to look presentable. I liked how the animation looked in Blender, but seeing it in-game, I'm not so sure about it anymore. Doesn't matter right now, as long as you can tell it's a different action that it doesn't look outright horrible. Next thing was to finally put the updated model and animations in the game. Once I got that squared away, it was time to try something different. Up until now, I've been using Godot's Animation Tree node for managing the animations. It's a really powerful node with a lot of important features, but none of them are needed for my game. Instead, I'm going to be using the regular Animation Player node by itself, and call for each animation in the player's state machine. I wrote a custom function for switching around animations. The function has arguments for the name of the animation, the speed of the animation, the blending time for the next animation, and an additional argument that I'll get into in a minute. First I load up the animation player node itself into a variable. Right now, Godot 4 does this weird thing where you can't get autocomplete on referenced nodes unless you write as node type after the assignment. Then I also load up the name of the current animation into a variable, called lastAnim. I then run an if statement checking to see if the new animation's name isn't the same as the current one, or if the final argument of a function force restart is set to true. If either of those conditions are met, then I double check to make sure that the animation I want to play actually exists by writing if anim player dot has animation anim name. If that check returns true, then we're good to play the desired animation. 
If that check returns false, then we instead play this broken rolling animation that was left over from the gold speedster model that I built this current model from. The goal here is to just ensure no catastrophic errors happen by a typo, but I'll still be able to easily notice when I screw up. After starting the new animation, I set a variable in the script called a current anim, which is exactly what it sounds like. This will be useful later. I also check to see if the new animation is set to loop or not, and write that to a variable. And then I set my animation finished variable to false, since it definitely isn't yet. After that, I set the playback speed and blend time with the related arguments in the function, and there we go. I also added two other functions, set anim speed and set anim crossfade, so that I can specifically set those parameters on their own. This isn't explicitly needed, since the animation will only get reset by calling the set anim function if I specifically tell it to, but this feels better to me. Anyway, being able to constantly set the animation speed was necessary for my walking and running animations, since I want those animations to speed up or slow down with how fast the character's moving. I've got one more function related to animations, which is never called by the script itself, but is instead linked to the animation player node's animation finish signal. This just allows me to set that animation finished variable to true if a non-looping animation has stopped playing. So far I only need this for one specific scenario, but it may come in handy again later. Back in my state machine, each state now calls the player's setAnim function within their enter function, which you can think of like ready, but this instead gets called every time the state becomes the active state, and not just once on initialization. The walk, run, and sprint states all call setAnim speed every frame, to keep the animation aligned with the player's movement speed and the idle state starts with the soft landing animation if the previous state was the air state. Back in game, there's still some rough edges, but this is a whole hell of a lot easier for me to manage than the animation tree state machine. That thing got messy with just six animations. That system would probably work a lot better in a scenario where there's only a few specific animation transitions you need to worry about. For my game, I feel like this was the better choice. The animation tree node still has a lot of other useful features that you might want or need for your own game though. Blend Space 1D and Blend Space 2D specifically are particularly useful for more complex interactions between animations and actions. Like say if you wanted to have a character hold different weapons in different positions while walking and running, and then be able to change their aim along with the camera. Again, this isn't needed for my game, but don't write off the node entirely. I actually might need it honestly. Now that I've got all that out of the way, it's time to re-implement some features that got cut with the transition to the state machine this past Thursday. And this actually highlights another con with a state machine system like this. You're likely going to have a lot of repeated code, which is another reason why I suggested only using one if your game is going to have a lot of different actions and interactions between them. This is probably the last time I'll bring up state machines in any kind of depth, so while I'm here I'll point you to a couple of helpful resources regarding them. GD Quest Q&A just recently put out a video about when it's appropriate to use a state machine in your game, and they also have a nice guide for how to make one. Check it out in the description, it's what I use to get started as well. I've still got time left in the day, so it's time to add some more movement mechanics. First I'll add wall jumping. I'll probably add in the wall slide later on, but for now we're going for a Mario 64 style, because it's the simplest to get up and running. For this, I started by adding a Raycast 3D to my character scene. I've inserted it as the child of the player model scene, since the actual character controller itself never rotates. This ray casts to about 0.7 meters in front of the character's origin, and right about chest height. The length is important for a couple reasons. First, I need to be able to wall jump from a fairly wide range of angles, so being able to actually reach the wall is important. Second, this gives you a little bit of buffer time. If the player hits the jump button slightly before touching the wall, the action will still go through. Stuff like this is all over in game design, and really important. You don't want to deal with constant complaints that your controls are unresponsive, and it just feels so much better to play. Anyway, I've set the collision mask to layer 2, so that way I can keep layer 1 as the general physics collision layer, while layer 2 will be used for checks like this. Of course, make sure the things you want the ray to collide with are also on layer 2, or else you might be sitting there for 15 minutes wondering why it won't work. Now in the player script, I check if the wall jump ray is colliding, and if we're not on the floor. If so, then we get to work. First I get the collision normal of the wall and store it into a variable. Then I get the angle of the wall in relation to the player by getting the dot product of the wall normal by using vector3.forward, rotated along the y-axis using the player model's y rotation as the value. And then I multiply it by negative 120. Okay, a lot of that may have gone over your head, but you probably heard 120 and thought, what? Yeah, I don't get it either. So the dot product if unaltered will always be between negative 1 and positive 1. Okay then, so we simply multiply that by 180 to get the full 360 degrees, right? That's what I thought. But when I turned the player around using this value multiplied by 180, I was getting some pretty wild overshoots. 120 seemed to be the sweet spot, or at the very least good enough. These angles look to be what I was after, so here we are. Okay, hey, uh, a little unscripted bit here after the fact while editing. 
this was really dumb. Uh, I told you to hold your comments for a reason. Yes, I'm aware this was dumb. Uh, I've been noticing it for the past week, and it's really hitting me now while editing this. Uh, the dot product, as I alluded to in the when showing the image, uh, when using normalized vectors, which I was not, will always be between negative 1, which represents a 180 degree angle, and positive 1, which represents a zero degree angle. So if I was using normalized vectors, which again I was not, then it should have been multiplied by 90, not 120. And also this is stupid. There are other ways I could have handled this. You'll see it later on. I... Back to the video. All right. After watching out for the angle of the dangle, there's still a few things left. Initially, I didn't like the idea of just being able to wall jump without having to put any effort into it, so I made the check in the air state also require the player to be moving at least half as fast as the top walk speed. This is something I'm likely to tweak, or maybe even just scrap, as I feel like it's a little too restrictive, but I'll leave it for now. Then, since you can't just wall jump at any point you're touching the wall, I'm setting a timer so that if you miss the hard timing by around 8 or 9 frames, you still get the wall jump. Again, this helps make the controls feel more responsive. Imagine what wall jumping in Mario 64 would be like if you only had one frame to wall jump. Oh, and uh, I haven't made a wall jump animation yet, so I'm just using the triple jump animation for now. Cool, wall jumping's in. What's next? Well, I could go for wall sliding, but I've had enough of walls for now. Let's do a mechanic that has nothing to do with walls, ledge grabbing. Wait, ledge grabbing was a little bit trickier than I expected, but it was made a lot easier by already having the wall jump mechanics in place and working. You thought one ray cast was cool? Well, how about two? First, I cast a ray just a little bit in front of the character. 0.45 meters may not seem that tiny, given that my player is only 2 meters tall, but the character's collision box cuts it down, making it closer to 0.25 meters of effective range. This is fine, though, since I only want the ledge grab to start when I'm literally hugging the wall. Anyway, I place the ray just a little bit lower than the top of the character's helmet. Next, I added another ray. This one will cast downward and intersect with the first ray, giving me the height value of the ledge we're on. Over in my player script, I have a ledge pose variable. We'll throw in the first ray's collision point, which gives us the wall. Then we correct the y value of the position to be the one from the second ray. This is so I can make the player snap to the same vertical position every time they grab the ledge. Now we get the normal and the angle from the first ray. And since our previous wall ray cast is likely to give us the same information, we're just going to override the wall angle variable with the ledge angle in the event that the wall ray isn't colliding with anything. As I'm writing this script, I'm realizing that not having the wall and ledge angles be separate could cause issues with really complex geometry, but I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Just like with the wall jumps, I set the can grab ledge variable to true only if we're within a desired range of angles. Okay, cool. Add the state transition from the air state again, and we're good to go- Oh. I mean, I wasn't really expecting it to go smoothly on the first try. Okay, we need another ray. As funny as up warps are, it, this is not what I wanted. We're going to use this third ray effectively as a duplicate of the first one, to ensure we're not trying to just ledge grab a wall. I ended up placing it a decent little bit higher to make sure we weren't getting any weirdness with neither ray being triggered on one frame, and then both being triggered on the next frame. But okay, I don't want to always grab the ledge by just being sort of close to it. So I'll add an is on wall check in the if statement for the state transition. Now, I thought this would be the end of that, but I ran into another issue. In Godot 3, at least in 2D, is on wall would only return true if there was a force pushing the object into the wall, like player movement, for example. Not the case here. If I'm touching the wall, is on wall is true. So once again, I'm grabbing the ledge when I don't necessarily want to. Now, if you thought three rays were cool, wait till you see four. This fourth ray is going to be placed just slightly below the first one. And this time, we're going to dictate where it casts to with code. First, I set its rotation to always be the opposite of the player models. Could I have just placed the ray as a parent of the character body instead of the rotating player model? Perhaps. But I didn't. Anyway, after doing that, we're going to set the ray's target position, which is called cast to in Godot 3, to the input vector. But I don't want any weirdness with it adjusting vertically with the camera, so I'm making sure that the Y value is always set to zero. Now we can check if this ray is colliding with the wall as well. Now we're finally only grabbing the ledge when we want to. Alright, one more thing with ledges. I don't want jumping to be the only way to get out of a ledge grab. I want it so that if you press the opposite direction of the ledge, you just fall off. Initially I tried using the sharp turn variable that my movement code has, but it works related to movement speed, which there is none while you're on the ledge, so no dice. Instead what I did was just add an area 3D with a box collider behind the player's head. 
then I assigned it to a group so that I know for sure this is the object that I'm looking for. And there we go, it works. Whew. That was a lot, but I still need a ledge gram animation. Using the triple jump for the wall jump is serviceable, but this just looks broken. So I opened up Blender and whipped up something real fast. And boom, there we go. Day two and I've already exceeded last week's script. Oh, this video is going to be a hell to make. Day three started off with me just tweaking stuff related to already present mechanics. I gave certain actions their own export variables so I can easily tweak things like wall jump height and distance. I added the ability to wall jump out of the triple jump, since it's the only jump where you can't end it early. I also removed the is on wall check from the ledge grab code, since it was redundant and just made it more likely that you wouldn't grab a ledge when you clearly wanted to and should have. I also increased the space between the two horizontal rays for the ledge grab, since the top one was still close enough to the bottom one that you'd still miss ledge grabs that clearly should have worked. I also increased the range of angles you can ledge grab from. All this is stuff I'll have to tweak more as time goes on, of course. Once all that was done, I decided to get to work on a new mechanic, air jumping. I'm personally not really a big fan of mid-air jumps in 3D platformers, as to me it feels like a bit of a lazy way to give the player extra control over the jumps. However, this isn't just a 3D platformer, and the purpose of all these movement abilities are to provide a large number of ways to get past whatever obstacles the player comes across. The wall jump and air jump, potentially the grounded multi-jumps as well, are things I've planned to have locked behind some sort of relic or equip system, so it's unlikely the player will have access to all three early on, maybe even ever. That's subject to change of course, but we'll just have to see how things pan out. Adding an extra jump in the air was really easy actually. All I needed to do was allow the player to jump from the air state as long as their current air jump count is less than their max air jump count. But let's be real here. A mid-air jump isn't just for extra height or distance. It's also there for correction. I really wasn't happy with just continuing the same trajectory with maybe a little extra time to stop yourself if needed. That's the kind of thing you'd want for something like a kick in Mario 64, the spin in Galaxy, or the hat throw in Odyssey. I started with just snapping the player 90 or 180 degrees in the other direction, using the same method I did for letting go of a ledge without jumping. This felt... bad. Is it really a correctional jump if you don't feel like you're in control of where you're going? No, it's not, so this wasn't going to suffice. I spent a good while trying to figure out how I could get the angle of the player's input direction in relation to the where the player model is actually facing, but this is what I settled on. Two more rays. One is effectively a duplicate of the original input vector ray, but this time it casts a full meter in front of the player and has no collision. For now. The other is programmed to always cast one meter directly in front of the player model, again with no collision. Side note, I could probably really easily do this whole calculation without extra ray casts, but this is what I started with, so this is what I'm explaining. This time we're using the Vector3's angle2 function to get the angle between the two vectors in radians, which we then convert to degrees with the built-in Godot function rad to deg. Now we have the angle of the input vector in relation to the player model's rotation. Cool. But there's a problem. The value is always between 0 and 180. This means that it has no idea if the player is trying to move left or right just the relative angle. The way I solved this was by resorting to having the ray collide on its own layer again. We've got a little half box on the player's left side, so that if the ray is colliding with this part, we invert the value of the angle. Now we know if the angle is negative, that means it's to the left of the player. If it's positive, it's to the right. And now with this system, I can also ditch using the collision area behind the player to detect if they want to let go of a ledge. And instead I just look for a specific angle range. I'm also using this system to limit the player's air acceleration when moving side to side. So cool, air jumping is in. Solid. But then I had an idea. While trying to get the player to rotate correctly, I accidentally stumbled upon a formula that made it so the player goes backwards when doing an air jump. What if I made this a feature? A fun backflip air jump that made you go at full speed. It could be tricky to use effectively, but in the right hands would allow you to do some serious shit. Long story short, I spent a lot of time trying to make this work well in a way that didn't seem overpowered, but I never got to a point where I was super happy about it. Maybe another time. I also added a variable that, if set to true, makes wall jumps reset your air jumps. This was as broken as it sounds. A late to end game ability for sure. After I got all that done, I spent a large amount of time just running around the test map playing with the movement. I'm getting to a point where I'm approaching the limit of what I feel like is a reasonable amount of moves to have in the game. On my to-do list, I've got wall sliding, but I think I'm actually just gonna not do that, in favor of making the current wall jump system more lenient. I'll eventually add an animation for when the player is able to do a wall jump, kind of like the pose from Super Metroid. I decided to do something other than programming for a little while by modeling a weapon. This took me way longer than it should've. It's so simple. Why am I taking two hours to make a low poly sword? 
Oh, and the textures, the textures. These fucking suck. I'm gonna redo like all of this, I hate it. But I wasn't gonna leave empty handed, eh? Huh? Let's get a preview of what a weapon would look like in the character's hand. Yep, I still hate this sword. Animations will have to be tweaked for the weapon holding to look right as well. Time for day four. I got home from work early today, so that means more time for game dev. I wanted to start work on crouching and sliding, so I started by making the animations in Blender. I'm fairly happy with how these turned out. Nothing really jumps out at me as looking really off. While I was at it, I tweaked the triple jump animation a little more, mainly making the transition to and from the wide pose at the end look nicer. I think it looks a little better, but honestly the effort was kind of wasted since the animation plays at 1.25 speed in game, and as a result you can barely tell the difference. I also finally made it so that the mesh and skeleton positions started the world origin. Since they weren't truly aligned previously, every animation has been very slightly altered, but not enough for anyone to notice. Note the self. Do this before making animations next time. Alright, time to re-import the model. Oh, and uh, if anyone watching knows a better workflow for re-importing a model into Godot, please let me know. Especially if there's an actual way for me to just grab the animations and be done with it. While I was here, I decided to mess around with the hair physics again. No, I didn't get them working correctly. The biggest issue is still the fact that the hair just randomly pops out of existence depending on the camera angle. After all that, it was finally time to put crouching and sliding into the game. Crouching was easy enough. Just kill the player's momentum so we don't get any weirdness. Transition to slide state if the player clearly wants to move. Transition back to idle if the crouch button is no longer held. Sliding took a hot minute to get working properly, but once it was working, it was incredible. In the slide state itself, I first rotate the player model to where the player is actually trying to move. Next, I set the velocity of the player, aligned to the player model's Y rotation. If the player is coming in from the sprint state, we start 25% faster than the sprint speed. If the player is coming in from a crouch or the run state, we start 50% faster than the walk speed. That might seem a little strange at first, but the hard numerical increase in values ends up being about the same, around 2.25. I don't want the slide to be crazy fast just because you were holding another button, but I also want it to be a little faster. Anyway, we're actually calling a new movement function for this state, do slide movement. This is largely the same as the do ground movement function, with a few key alterations. First being that there's no acceleration here, only deceleration and only if the player's speed is higher than one-third of the walk speed. Next, I've cut down the turn speed to just one-fifth. Like air movement, this lets you have a little bit of control over your trajectory, but you still need to be confident in where you're sliding to. In the player script, I've added a few new variables. One of them is just the speed multiplier for the slide. The other two are the slide timer and time sliding. You're probably wondering what slide timer is if there's also time sliding, but let me explain. Time sliding is exactly what it sounds like. It's how long you've been sliding. This is used for manipulating speed and gravity depending on how long you've been sliding, and is also used in conjunction with your current speed to determine when you'll be forced out of the slide state. Slide timer is instead used to prevent you from chaining slides too quickly. Hey, 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 don't worry, give me a minute, alright? When you perform a dashing slide, the slide timer is set to 1.5 seconds, though that's probably going to get cut down by at least a quarter second. When you perform a non-dashing slide, the slide timer is set to 0.5 seconds. That'll also probably get cut down a little bit. I don't want the player to get a free speed boost and instant turning by just spamming the crouch button repeatedly. So, can you just not chain slides? WRONG! When you enter the air state, the slide timer is set to 0.0, .0 meaning that as soon as you land, you can perform another slide. Want to chain your slides together for some fast and fun movement? Just jump between your slides. But that's not all. You take two and a half times as long to enter the air state from a slide, meaning you can jump further off a ledge than you would normally. And that's on top of getting an initial speed boost, of course. It's kind of really busted. I mean, I could just make it less busted, but... I probably should, to be honest. But I also probably shouldn't. Just like that, that right there, that's fun. I want the game to be fun. Now, there may be some of you watching this and thinking, oh no, I'll have to do a bunch of crazy advanced movement tricks in order to get through the game. Let me assure you that this will not be the case. Once again, my goal here is to make a mix between Mario 64 and Castlevania. The Metroidvania style Castlevanias, I should clarify. Neither of those games require super precise movement or the utilization of advanced tech, and this game won't either. The point is to have fun movement mechanics that facilitate cool tricks. 
If the way you play Mario 64 is simply by walking to your destination and carefully lining up your jumps, you'll be right at home here. Likewise, if this is how you like to play your 3D Mario games, you'll probably also have a good time. Movement has gotten to the point where there's basically nothing else I want to add, and all that's left is adding more animations and tweaking parameters. So because of that, I think it's going to be time to really start work on combat soon. Alright, day 5, time to work on combat stuff. Wait a minute. I never added a stomp ability! Oh well. This is one of those abilities where I'd specifically want to add a new animation for it. So I'll work that in with the combat stuff, and other animations that need to be added. These animations suck! But they'll have to do for now. I made animations for being hurt, hurt in the air, getting hurt big time, get up animations, stomp, and two slashes, one of them getting an air variant. Honestly, they don't annoy me quite as much in the game, but I'm still not happy with them. Anyway, it was time to create the stomp ability. Kill player movement, set the velocity really fast downward, don't change the state until landing, okay, cool, done. Next I spent a lot of time setting up for attacks and enemy interactions, then finally getting the attacks in game. I spent the largest amount of time just tweaking the speed of the attacks, and tweaking the physics of the air slash. I'll add another attack for sliding as well at some point, but not tonight. I'd go more in depth, but I'm tired and this video is long enough as is. Time for day 6. Like last week, days 6 and 7 were pretty much just me working on this video. The script is about twice as long, so I had a lot more to do. That's why this video probably came out late. Weeks 3 and 4 probably won't have quite as much for me to talk about or go in depth on, but we'll see. Anyway, make sure you stay tuned on Christmas, as that's when this challenge ends, and when you can play the game for yourself. Remember to check out my Twitter and Mastodon for smaller and more frequent updates on what's happening. Check my Twitch as well as here on YouTube for any streams, game dev or otherwise. And check out my Discord for frequent info on all that and more. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye for now.